As I was saying, um, you know, we, as Ron said, we moved back to Fayetteville last fall. It's been great to be back. Um, kind of feels like we're back home. It's been really nice. Thanks to the club for really making me feel welcome. And uh, got a great group of people here. I um, wanted to thank Ron and the club for the invitation to speak tonight. And, and what I'll say is, if you like what I have to say and you enjoy it, I appreciate the thanks. If you don't like it, let Ron know. <laughs> He's the one to blame. He kept uh, bugging me and, uh, you know, um, trying to get me to, to do this. And I, I stalled for a while, but I finally gave in. So anyway, uh, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects. I've always liked to build antennas. When I first got licensed, I built my first dipole antenna and put it up in the air. I had to go to a hardware store and, and buy house wire and strip it out and, and managed to find some PVC pieces and, and threw together an antenna and it actually worked. It was kind of an amazing feeling. It's like, wow, I built this and it actually does something. And so that kind of got me started. And so all along I've been playing and tinkering and I like to build my own antennas. I have bought a couple of commercial antennas, but I tend to prefer to build what I can. So what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit, of, uh, a little bit about the process of building antennas, a little bit about the theory behind how they work. And hopefully we'll all go away with a new appreciation of what that hunk of metal out in the yard or in the trees does for us. So I'll try to keep the math simple. We'll just do a little bit of math. This is intended to be a fun presentation. As I said, fun with antennas. So a little bit of math. Everybody's seen Maxwell's equations. You're completely familiar with those. I won't go into detail unless it's necessary. The thing about Maxwell's equations is they actually do a lot, they tell us a lot about what's going on in the world. I remember my, one of the professors in grad school for E&M class said that you can basically take Maxwell's equations and a couple other things and drive everything in physics. There's, there's a lot of what's going on in the world there. So, you know, the first Scouse's law is basically talking about charge. It's saying if there's charge, a charge, and you look at the electric field around it, the electric field is proportional to the density of that charge, how much charge there is there. That's all it says. The magnetism one says the same thing. Gauss's law for magnetism. It's basically saying if you've got a magnetic, um, a magnetic, think of a magnet or whatever in a, in a space, you don't find north or south poles by themselves, you find the two. So if you take that space around it, the net field is zero. So there's no such thing as a magnetic monopole. Those are mostly static cases. These are the things we kind of use every day. This is basically pointing out that we can make an electric field by changing a magnetic field. So if magnetic field's changing, transformers use this, right? And the inverse is we can make a magnetic field by changing an electric field or a current. And that's really the crux of, of these. This is, this is, oops, sorry. This is what we do in terms of, you know, radio, generating radio waves. This is what makes radio waves possible. This is, you know, this is defines how light, radio waves, everything works, every electromagnetic wave functions. So that's about all the math we're going to do. This is kind of a fun application of that. This was at Maker Faire in San Mateo, California a couple of years ago. This is a massive Tesla coil system. So what's here is, the prim is, a, is a transformer. I think this had about 10 turns on the primary and, and I think they said 400 turns on the secondary. And then these are additional transformers. So this steps up the signal to some voltage, it gets fed to this and gets stepped up. The potential between these two, uh, what they said was 60 megavolts, 60 million volts. So this would literally arc across between these two points. But this is an application of Gauss's law. It's a magnetic field generating an electric field, and that magnetic field that generates the electric field and generates a very high voltage to a transformer. So basically the transformer is an application of, of, of uh, Maxwell's equations. There's one other kind of neat thing. I'm just going to throw this in just kind of to talk about it. But if we look at these two, and we say that, you know, the changing magnetic field and changing electric field, these define an electromagnetic wave. But there's an interesting thing about this. So if the changing electric field creates a magnet, magnetic field and a magnetic field creates an electric field, what does that mean? Well, it means we have a self-propagating wave, right? The electric field can generate the magnetic field. The magnetic field can generate the electric field. So it's kind of, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. But what that means is exactly that. We have a propagating electromagnetic wave, what we know as light or radio. So that's kind of the cool piece that comes out of, of these equations. 
The other neat thing about it is if you solve those two equations, partial differential equations, you get an interesting result. And this was one of the things that, that came out. If you calculate from these and solve for the velocity of that waveform, it, it basically goes down to two constants and it gives us a speed of about 300, what is that, 300 million um, meters per second roughly. So that's the speed of light in vacuum. And that's derived from these equations. It was also around the same time measured empirically and these ag results agreed really well. So it told us and told Maxwell that, these, that light must be an electromagnetic wave. Okay, but why do we care about all that, right? It's kind of interesting math, but there's some cool stuff. But we all use antennas. And an antenna is really designed to create an electric and magnetic field, electromagnetic field, or receive an electromagnetic field. So there's lots of different types of antennas. This is a vertical, I think a 5B TV. I have one of these. That's one of the two commercial antennas I've ever bought, and it, it works reasonably well. This is a multiband dipole. This is a magnetic loop. And this is, um, these were sort of popular a few years ago called an isotron antenna. I'll talk a little more about that later. But these are all, while they look fairly different, these all really work the same way. They all essentially generate an electromagnetic field through some mechanism. So if you go to Webster, what's the definition of, a, of an antenna? Well, an antenna is basically you know, it's defined as a metal rod or something used for receiving radio waves or radiating. And that's how we use it. But you know, what, it, what really is an antenna? What, what is it doing? I like to think of it as it's a circuit that either leaks or gathers electromagnetic energy, <laughs> right? That's kind of what we want it to do. If we take a feed line, like a parallel line feed line like this, there's very little leakage. The currents and the fields, the electric fields and magnetic fields cancel, so there's very little radiation from this. How do we make that into an antenna? Well, if we start separating the conductors, you start to get some leakage. The pieces up here on the end, the, the fields no longer completely cancel, a little bit of that field is radiated. If we take that to extreme, it looks like our garden variety dipole, and that the nice thing about that is now it's leaking a lot because the fields don't cancel as well. And that's really what an antenna is. An antenna is a circuit designed to basically leak RF power into the, into the environment. So that when you have an antenna, that antenna is going to generate, and this is a case of a dipole with an AC current source feeding it, we're going to generate an electric field and a transverse magnetic field and Coincidentally, this would be vertically polarized since the electric field's in the vertical direction. That's how we define polarization, by the way, is by the direction of that field. And that field then self-propagates itself at the speed of light by alternating electric and magnetic fields. So it's kind of neat. Um, we're going to dive a little deeper into antenna, kind of how antennas work. So there's a few things that are kind of important to think about, and you'll run across these, most of you have taken some of the various level ham exams, you run across resistance, reactance, impedance, and even resonance, so these are probably fairly familiar to most of you, but it's still good to kind of think about what we're talking about. So reactance is how we, how we gauge a, com a particular component's interaction with AC fields, with oscillating electric fields, and we have Whoops, keep hitting the wrong button. So we have both inductive reactance, and, and that's defined here as two times pi times the frequency times the inductor value in Henry's, and same with capacitance, one over two pi frequency times the capacitance in, in uh, farads and uh, inductance in Henry's. So for this, you can solve for the reactance of those components at any given frequency. While impedance is the sum of essentially the inductive and capacitive reactance plus any resistance in the circuit. So impedance is a total impedance. When we say an antenna has 50 ohms impedance, that can be 50 ohms resistive, that can be some fraction of that resistive, and some part of that can be reactive impedance. Ideally, we want our antenna to look purely resistive, but that's not always the case. 
And the total here, just the, the key thing to remember is that the total you know, here is basically the inductive minus the capacitive. So what, what does that mean in a resonant antenna? This is a circuit model of a typical antenna. This applies to any, pretty much any of the antennas I showed you earlier, dipole, vertical, or whatever. It's going to have a capacitive component. It's going to have an inductive part, and it's going to have a resistive. This is the part that actually radiates the power that we feed into the antenna. We call this the radiation resistance. So this is ideal case. We're ignoring resistance of the conductors and things like that. This is just an ideal case of an antenna saying it looks like capacitance, inductance, and reactance. So we can define the capacitive and inductive reactance as we talked about for those, and the total reactance, and therefore the impedance of the antenna. At resonance, the way we define resonance is that it's the point where inductance and capacitive reactances are equal and opposite, so they cancel. And so at resonance, since these are equal, the, the impedance of that antenna circuit now is just left with this R. And that's our goal with most antennas is we want to say at resonance, we really want this thing to look like a resistor. So that all of our power is irradiated and we have a nice, nice, you know, nice resistive looking uh, load on our transmitter. So we talked earlier about a dipole, and, and as I said, a dipole is just the circuit, and this is a good example of, I uh, apologize, the picture is not great here, but basically open wire feed line and then conductors going off in a different direction. And what that does is generates an electric field by moving charge in the, we, we feed in an oscillating sine wave, and it actually generates a field in the, uh, in the wire, and that generates an electric field and a magnetic field, and we, we generate elect electromagnetic waves, or what we know as radio. So for a half-wave dipole, let's think a little bit about what's going on in there. Because the dipole has finite length, we're feeding in a sine wave. At half-wave, we know there's going to be a half-wave length in the dipole. We know that the ends, if we look at current and voltage, well, the current's going to have to go to zero at the ends because there's no other place for it to go. And you're feeding in in the middle, so the middle is likely is the current maxima, and the ends are, are the... Uh, zero points in current. If we look at that section of the half wave for voltage, it's out of phase with that. And so we have at the ends, obviously, we think there should be a pretty low, low point here and should be a high point at the ends because the voltage is basically uh, uh, building up at the ends. So we have charge separation in the antenna and we generate an electric field. Because that charge is moving, we're also generating a magnetic field. So that's kind of the simple way to think about the antenna. So what about a vertical? A lot of us, how many people use vertical antennas? Not that many, surprise. There, there's the old saying that a vertical is an antenna that radiates poorly in all directions. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It gets a bad rap. It gets a bad, a bad reputation because of people don't always apply it properly. When you have a vertical antenna, it's now typically a quarter wavelength long, and it's depending on what's going on in the ground beneath it to sort of make up that other half of that antenna, the other quarter wavelength or, uh, that would be the dipole. Because when we look at it, if we've got our antenna here, we've got our ground, and we've got an image of that antenna generated by the ground, we've got current flowing in that circuit. There's current flowing in the ground, there's current flowing into the antenna we don't want to have a lot of loss in that ground circuit. And if you put up a vertical without radials, without some conducting field underneath, uh, conducting material underneath, that's going to very likely um, result in a very poor radiator. And that's probably the reputation for a vertical. I, I learned that when I was first licensed. Um, I had dipoles up in one of my, my Elmer, uh, some of you actually I probably know him, K5LG Lester Grandin from over around Harrison was the person who helped me get licensed. And uh, he loaned me a, probably was a 4B TV, I think it was one of the early Hustler vertical antennas. And not knowing any better, I went out and drove a, a post in the ground and I mounted on that and hooked up a feed line to it. And compared to my dipole, it worked horribly. It was really poor performance. And I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't understand that that was not the entire antenna. It actually needed a ground field of radials underneath it. So why is that? Well. If we look at the antenna circuit, 
we take that model that we talked about earlier on a generic antenna and we add something because the vertical now has some a loss component that's that's due to effectively the ground below it because again that current's trying to flow through the ground so what we're trying to do with this with a vertical is we're trying to obviously maximize this we want it to be resonant so this goes away we want to maximize this and minimize this so how do we do that well radials a radial is a, basically a conducting a conductor of some type it can be wires it can be a sheet of metal I remember reading a few years ago about a, a, a well-known uh, ham who ran a lot of 80 and 160 meters and had a vertical antenna and apparently covered an entire hillside with chicken wire and then buried it and made an antenna, you know, vertical over that field and had a very well, very good performing vertical antenna on 80 and 160. So there's a lot of things you can do, but the, but the thing you're doing is you're really trying to have a good conducting surface to create that image for replacing the missing half of the antenna, the other quarter wavelength of that, what should be a half wave antenna. So with radials, well, generally more is better. Why is that? If you take a single wire placed on the ground, what does that look like? Well, I like to think of things in terms of modeling. What's the model for that? We well, can sort of say it's like a whole bunch of capacitors coupling to the resistance of the ground. So if you, if you remember your parallel and, and parallel capacitors and parallel resistance, parallel capacitors add and parallel resistors decrease the total value, right? Because you have more current pass. So if you do this, you get a larger value capacitor, you know, the longer your radial is or the more radials you add, you get a larger value capacitor and you get a lower value resistance in your ground circuit. So therefore you reduce losses. So you want to end up doing things like this. This is uh, you know, a typical vertical with a radio field on the ground. Um, a few years ago, we were living out in New Jersey, and uh, I was setting up my ham station. We'd bought a house, and, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do for an antenna. And I ended up building a uh, vertical antenna that was built out of basically three 10-foot sections of copper pipe, um, starting at one inch, I think three quarters, and then half inch or whatever had to guy it because the copper is a little flexible, but I built this, I painted it green, by the way, forest green, and it blended in really well with the pine trees and other things in our backyard. So the neighbors didn't even notice it. But for radials, I was trying to come up with, a, what do I want to do for the, you know, for the ground system? I knew at that point I needed a really good ground system. So I went down to one of the local hardware stores and I found a roll of, I think it was a quarter mile of, of, of aluminum electric fence wiring. And I started burying that in radials until I ran out of wire. And so I had a really good radial field. The antenna, the more radials I added, the better it performed. And one of the things you'll notice if you put up a vertical is if you put up a vertical without much of a ground field, you may actually get a pretty good match. You may see something close to 50 ohms. A vertical should actually be closer to 35 ohms. You should have like a you know, 1.4, 1.5 to 1 SWR if the vertical is actually performing well. And so as I added radials, I noticed that my SWR actually went up a little bit, but my performance on the antenna went up as well. And, you know, I, I pity the person who someday decides to dig up that backyard because there's a quarter mile of wire buried just about two inches down into the surface all throughout the backyard. They're going to think some, you know, nutcase lived here. But uh, it really does make a difference. It makes the antenna, it takes it out of that, you know, poorly radiating all directions into something that actually works, works very well. So one of the things I like to do when I'm, I'm thinking about these things or trying to explain and, and sometimes working with groups like, you know, high school groups or something to, to kind of teach how does something work. And this is something I came up with a few years ago, a way of visualizing a vertical antenna, what it does, a vertical antenna and a vertical antenna over ground. So I took, I don't know how well you can see that in the light. This is actually a uh, light stick, you know, those chemical light sticks. It's kind of a nice reference because I wanted to see what does it do if I put it over no ground? And how I simulate ground is by a surface that then better reflects the light. So we take a, this is a case of a white poster board and I, I don't know if we can kill, I don't know if we can kill enough lights, but you can see the antenna and, and you can then see there's a, there's a very poor reflection of it here. And that's putting the light stick in the dark over a, a piece of just white poster board. And then if you put it over something like a piece of aluminum foil 
a reflecting surface. This is what you see. And this is really what you're trying to do when you install a vertical in the radial system, is you're trying to generate a image of the antenna. So you want your radial field to be sufficiently dense and sufficiently you know, big enough to actually generate an, a, a reflection of that antenna or an image, if you will. In that case, you, have, you should have a, a vertical that works very, very well. So a lot of times, you know, if you get on, you look at verticals for 80 and 160 and even 40 meters sometimes, putting up a full size vertical is a challenge. You know, an 80 meter vertical is what, 65 feet for a quarter wave and a 160s makes it 130 or so feet. So not many of us have a 130 foot vertical up in our backyard. And, you know, so we look at ways to, to kind of cheat, if you will, and shorten that. So the first thing that we, we realize that happens is as you shorten the antenna that balance between inductance and capacitance goes out of whack. So now a shortened antenna you've got some capacitance but you've got less inductance so the antenna is not going to be resonant at that frequency that you're trying to work. So remembering the resonance equations you can say yeah okay what do we need to do? Well we need to probably add some inductance, inductive reactants. And that's basically by adding a loading coil, adding some, some inductance somewhere in the circuit. This is an example of that. This is a coil loaded vertical um, that I developed a few years ago. This is one of the Pacific Antenna Pac-12 antennas. These use fixed coils and I've got a few of those over here to kind of show. But what this does is we've got a six foot telescoping whip on top. We've got about a two foot section at the bottom and I've got a little loading coil here. And that loading coil, that happens to be, I think that one's for 40 meters. That loading coil provides sufficient inductance to offset the capacitance of the short antenna and balance it to back to resonance. There's a little bit of loss in the coil, so it's always a trade-off. It's not going to be as efficient as a full-size antenna, but it's also a lot smaller. So you can do the same thing for 80 and 160, obviously, and build verticals that have loading and, and reduce the overall size of the antenna. And with, with antennas like this, you know, those, some of you use the Hustler style mobiles or ham sticks or whatever, you can change the inductance or change the component in the antenna and you can actually change the resonance for different bands. Going back to talking about verticals, so at the time I was starting to play more with antennas, I was traveling a lot for the startup company I was with. And, and I was ending up in exotic destinations like what, Midland, Michigan, Baytown, Texas, State College, Pennsylvania. And because we were doing installs of some, some very complex lab equipment, um, I would be there over the weekends, often be there for, for weeks at a time. Sometimes I think six weeks was the longest stint in, in Baytown, Texas. So I had a lot of weekends with not a lot to do, and so I started taking ham radio equipment along with me. And I was taking wires and a tuner and bits and pieces and dipoles, and I tried a lot of different things. They're not always trees. It takes time to put things up in trees, and, and I found out some park rangers and folks get irate if you start messing with their trees. So, you know, you run into sometimes people going, don't, you know, don't mess with our tree branches or don't put things in our tree. So I started playing around with designs for a, for a uh, portable vertical antenna. And again, I could have gone out and bought something, but you know, I, when I looked at it, I said, you know, I really don't want to buy it, I want to build something. I want to see what I can do. So this is a sketch of what I ended up with. This is all plumbing fittings from Home Depot. A uh, quarter inch aluminum rod, coupling nuts, and basically a little piece of aluminum plate and a telescoping whip from Radio Shack. And so I put this together, um, ended up going somewhere someone saw it they asked me to write an you know i said would you write an article on this so i ended up writing an article it's published it's still out on the web you can go find it if you want to look for it search for pac 12 antenna and you can actually find the article to, to build one yourself if you want um, everything's available except the telescoping whip but uh, there are some we we do have those our, we stock those now custom made but radio shack no longer stocks those unfortunately but um, as of last count, people were emailing me, sending me pictures. I could document roughly about a thousand people worldwide that I knew about that had built these. So it actually kind of became, became viral well before 
you know, a lot of things were, the, the term viral is even around, but it, it really took off. There are people all over the world who built these. Some of them are really amazing. I should have brought the picture. There was a guy in Croatia who built one, and uh, he had to scavenge for parts, and he used different tubing, so he emailed me, and we went back and forth on, you know, designs of the coils and so forth. And he finally finished and sent me a picture, and he had used an old clutch pressure plate for the base, had setting it on his roof, and it was one of the favorite pictures because it's complete, you know, he scavenged for most of the parts and, and put this together, and, and this was his main antenna because he lived in an apartment, he couldn't have a full-size antenna outside. So that was kind of nice, and then ended up doing this, there was enough interest in it, people started asking me to build them for them, or supply them parts, or supply them kits. And we ended up doing, in 2003, as Ron mentioned, I said, well, you know what, I'll, I'll do a run of these. So we ordered a run of parts and stuff, and uh, did some kits, and they sold out pretty quickly. And so we did some more, and then we did some more, and so ended up kind of accidentally in the antenna business. But this is, uh, this is the home-built version. Again, a little closer up of the, of the coils, the diagram. These are screw-on caps. These are sprinkler risers. Basically, you can buy at any hardware store. Wire was from Radio Shack as well, back when Radio Shack used to exist and, and sold stuff that was useful um, before they became a cell phone store, basically, right, you know, toward the end. Um, but anyway, I worked out the, the size of these the, for the given PVC, you know, which riser length to use and, and where to drill the holes in it and how many turns to put on it. So you could build these anything from, you know, 40 meters and up. And then I actually did do a design for an 80 meter coil. The 80 meter coil, I think, was on this size form, I think I want to say was 600 turns. So it was getting pretty massive. Um, you're already at 86 on the 40 meter, and it goes roughly as a square. So yeah, it, it gets pretty large. Um, so this was, but this, again, a lot of people built these, a lot of people used them, and there's still a bunch of them out there. I still run across people occasionally at HamFest. They'll come up and say, hey, I've got one of your antennas I built. And it's really cool. And uh, so that was a lot of fun. You know, I just did it for fun. And, and uh, as I said, accidentally ended up in the antenna business by doing that. So another thing we, I've been playing around with. Question? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. So what's on the other, the other half of the antenna, the Oh, good, good point. So, so the yellow coil possibly? Yeah, that's, that's actually part of the radial system. So you basically just deploy some wires on the ground. And we, with the commercial kit, we supply enough for eight radials with the standard. You know, that's kind of a minimum number I'd recommend. You normally want more, but when you're portable, you always make a trade-off. You don't want to spend all day putting out a radial field, you know, so getting eight radials on the ground reduces losses enough that it makes it, makes it worthwhile. So then you just set that like on, a, on the ground? Yeah. Table, yeah, you could just set it, you know, pretty much anywhere. This is a stand that we, we developed for it as well. It also came with a spike that you just stick in the soft soil. Oh, okay. So, and then change the coil. So another thing I got interested in was trying to make some compact dipoles a few years ago and started tinkering around with this. This is a coil-loaded dipole. And so you basically, instead of having a full-length dipole, we add some inductance again in the form of a loading coil. And that loading coil will, will basically effectively shorten this antenna. So this is a 20 and 40 meter antenna that ends up being, I think it's around 45 feet overall instead of 65 feet. So it saves you about 20 feet. It's also lighter. The trick here is these aren't just coils, they're also traps. So trap is a parallel LC circuit. It's got a capacitor in parallel with the, with the coil and it's actually resonant. So the inside here is a 20 meter dipole. It's pretty much a full length 20 meter dipole. This is resonant at about 14.1 megahertz, and as a parallel resonant circuit, it looks very high impedance. So it acts like a block here. And so this, at 20 meters, your RF just sees this intersection of the antenna. At 40, this now just looks like a loading coil. So basically, the capacitor doesn't have enough um, reactance. Its impedance is too high, so the, the RF all goes through the coil, and now you've got a shortened 40 meter antenna. So that's a good way to get on 20 and 40, and there's a lot of, you know, this is done in tri-band beams. This is pretty common in the, 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 eight, the high gain verticals. All of those kind of things use traps of some form or other. Another thing I'm just getting interested in is loop antennas. And 
I kind of initially was thinking, what, well, how does a loop antenna work? Because people refer to it as a magnetic loop. And it really is. It's kind of, the way to think about it, it's kind of the magnetic equivalent of a dipole. A dipole separates charge and generates an electric field, and the moving charge generates a magnetic field. Here we have very high currents flowing in this loop, and that generates a magnetic field. So this is primarily a magnetic antenna rather than a, an electric antenna. Um, you know, if you take a small loop, that's, these are typically what, one-tenth to one-fifth of a wavelength, I think, is the, is the standard for building them. So they're very small compared to, you know, what you would need for, for a full-size antenna. And therefore, it's inductive. You know, whereas our shortened antenna for a vertical is capacitive, in this case, it has inductance and not as much capacitance. So it's resonated by adding in series of variable capacitors. So typically you'll see a variable capacitor up here. This is a diagram of how these are built. So what you have is a, this, this is just a coupling loop down here. This is a little loop, kind of like a transformer or primary, that's a fraction of size of the main loop and that couple, the RF's fed into that and then the magnetic field of that couples into the, the coil and induces a current in the larger loop. There's a voltage variable capacitor across here, and typically these are tuned. This is with a stepper motor so that you are not standing near it when you're tuning because there's a very high magnetic field. These are, you know, can be dangerous for people, especially with pacemakers and things like that. So, but it's kind of interesting that you can take an antenna this small. The trade-off is the bandwidth is incredibly small. These things, you know, will have bandwidths of three or four kilohertz at most. You know, resonant bandwidth is very narrow, so you have to tune this very precisely to the operating frequency. But because it's a high Q circuit, it actually is pretty efficient. These things radiate pretty well and receive pretty well. I've, I've used one of these that friends have and, and been really amazed by the performance. So I'm starting to play around with some portable designs for this as a basically figuring out a way to make a reasonably efficient but very lightweight and portable version of this because obviously a big, a big uh, loop of copper tubing is not very easy to throw in a backpack. There are some out there with coax cable, but you know, coax cable is, is not that, you know, it's not that great because it's, it's kind of a rough conductor. You're looking at the braid and you're looking at RF trying to flow through the braid. You've got the plastic dielectric in there. So I'm starting to think about ways, if there are ways to make one of these that uh, might be a little different. But the other thing to look at on this is really going back to our antenna, you know, our antenna simulation model. This is really just an antenna. You know, it's, it's, it looks, the, the, the equivalent circuit looks like any other antenna. It's got some inductance, it's got some capacitance, and it's got some, in this case, loss resistance. So the radiation resistance of these is very small. Any loss in the loop, that's the critical thing. The circulating currents at, you know, 100 watts and above can be, you know, tens to hundreds of amps in these antennas. So there's a lot of current flowing through this very small antenna. And therefore, any resistance in the loop becomes a big source of loss. So that's one of the challenges in designing and, and playing with these. But there, again, it's, it's, a lot, it's very interesting to me to see what, you know, what can you do with this. So if you, wanna get, if you get interested in, say, you want to play with antennas and experiment, and I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. You know, if you enjoy building things, building with your hands, building antennas is a great kind of hobby, part of, you know, subset of the hobby, because you get to build something and see what works and then tweak it and try it and, and uh, see what comes out of it. There's some useful things that, you know, sort of from complex to less complex, more complex. What do you need for experimenting with antennas? Simple as a receiver in some cases. You can basically tune an antenna like a variable coil antenna by just listening to receiver. You can listen to the noise, background noise, and tell if your antenna is being in near resonance. Stepping up, you can use an SWR bridge and some RF source. You know, this can be a transmitter, a transceiver. This can be maybe a signal generator and simple SWR bridge. Um, you can use something like a noise bridge. Those are, again, things that generate a signal and, and you listen to that signal to get an idea where the antenna is in resonance. Stepping up to things like antenna analyzers. There's a bunch of these out there now. The costs are dropping. I mean, these used to be you know, hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars. They're now, you know, you can buy things, I think, on eBay for under 100 bucks for, a, for an antenna analyzer. 
Um, network analyzer, these are also dropping in cost. Um, I have one of these that's an HP that I think when it was new was probably like 35,000. So those are, you know, those are not cheap, but there's now versions of network analyzers out there. And I, I have one here I'll show you in a few minutes that's in the few hundred dollar range. Um, so good to have some good reference material. Local library, if they have it, some stuff of your own, you know, your own little source. And then simulation software. Um, if you bought a recent ARL antenna book, going back to reference material, there's um, quite a bit of software that comes with the antenna books and also with the handbook. And there's some neat little programs in there for simulating loading coils, simulating um, circuits, and so forth. So it's, it's really useful to, to kind of simulate your antenna design if you're calculating the loading coil parameters or ta calculating a loaded coil antenna or a loaded dipole or a trap resonance. There's a lot of resources out there that basically come with, come with some of the stuff from the ARL. So, what a, you know, again, antenna book. Can't recommend this highly enough. I've, I've got several of these and, and I go back to them. I've, I've picked up a few over the years from even older ones from like the 50s and 60s. And a lot of stuff hasn't changed. I mean, every now and then somebody comes out and says, oh, I've got this great new antenna that, you know, it's, does something amazing. Really? We've pretty much discovered most of that. You know, the laws of physics are pretty, pretty rigid and, and things don't really change much. So I'm always skeptical of that. But, you know, as I said before, stuff like an SWR bridge, some software for calculating things, an analyzer, antenna analyzer, and a network analyzer. This is a little called mini VNA. I think these are currently like three or $400 each, you know, for, for that. It runs on USB or through Bluetooth. We'll actually demonstrate that here in a minute. And then there's some more elaborate sort of all-in-one analyzers that include a screen and can plot the, the data and can basically measure antenna, look at the resonance, look at the SWR curves and so forth. And these are really nice. These are probably in the you know, several hundred to a thousand dollar range. All right, so I brought along some experiments just to kind of um, show a little bit about antennas. So let me... Uh, since I didn't get things fully set up, we were running a little rapid here. Let me grab a couple things. So this will be a little hard to see for you back there, but uh, let me get the microphone. As I said, this will be a little hard to see in the back of the room, but what I did is I put together a little circuit that's basically that same circuit I showed you of an antenna. It's an, a capacitor, an inductor, and a resistor in series. And what does that look like? Let's So I don't know if we could, can we reduce the lighting a little bit or re-aim a little bit? We're getting a lot of glare from the screen. Okay, thanks. It may be from this one. Can everybody see that okay? All right, so this is that little mini VNA I talked about. One of the things we can do is, is look at antennas and circuits. So if we connect that to our, uh, our circuit, hang on. So what we're doing is basically measuring, that's that circuit. That's a simulated circuit of an antenna. It's basically, it's one of the cool things about that. You can model an antenna as a circuit and build a model of it. And what we get is we can see there's a resonance here, basically looking at the uh, return loss. So we're saying return loss goes way down at resonance because now it absorbs. And if we look at one of the cool things, we can look at a lot of different parameters with this. So let's see. Yeah. So I'm looking at the resistance now. Whoops. Oh, there we go. Oh, wow. Didn't know this would actually work on that. Very cool.
So there's, there's roughly a 49 ohm resistor in there. So if we look at this is the return loss in green on this, on this chart, and you can see it goes down to like minus 24 dB or so, return loss at resonance, this nice resonance curve of that circuit. At the same time out here, we don't see the resistor because out here this looks capacitive, the capacitor blocks it. Out here the inductor blocks it, looks an antenna looks capacitive below re resonance and inductive above resonance. And right at resonance, we see that we come basically to 45 ohms, so we're basically seeing most of that resistor. So at resonance, our antenna looks resistive. That's our goal in any antenna is to try to get to that point where we basically, all of our RF is going into this resistor, which is the radi radiative loss or the radiation resistance. This means our RF is going into the antenna. So how does this look on a real antenna? So this is just, again, doing a frequency sweep, measuring the antenna, and I didn't make any effort to uh, tune this antenna to a particular frequency, so it should be somewhere in this range, I think, if I've got it set up right. Okay, there it is. Now, a real antenna doesn't look as nice as a, as a circuit. There's a lot of other stuff going on. There's some stray capacitance, there's some stray inductance, and a few things there, but it looks like we're resonant probably somewhere up in here above, you know, 40 something megahertz. We've got, you know, an area here. The resistance is off a little bit. So we've got, you know, the resistance is very high. You notice this here. If we look at the resistance, we're about 200 ohms. That's because we're missing part of that antenna. So the other part of our antenna is what? It's air, right? So there's a lot of loss. That's why a vertical without a ground system is a very poor performing antenna. It won't work very well. Let's look at a loaded antenna. So again, you know, the antenna is coupled to a lot of stuff here in the building. We got some pretty strange results here. Got a very high impedance point out here for some reason. We've got a resonance over here. It's about where I'd expect it. This coil should be around 20 meters, so it's a little low. Let's see. Put our cursor on there. We can actually see what that is. Okay, so around 11 or so megahertz was fully extended. But anyway, that this is a nice tool for kind of looking at an antenna and figuring out what's going on with it. And you'll see a lot of interesting stuff. We change the antenna, if we shorten it, we should see this change pretty drastically. And we see that our resonance moved up to about 25 ohms here, or 25 megahertz or so, with this shortened antenna with the loading coil. So, uh, you know, that would be, what, about a 15, 12, 15 foot antenna. So, um, you know, obviously it's, it's resonant at a different, uh, different level. We can see, let's limit something here, let's do this. We're going to zoom in on that resonance and ignore that large one. There we go. So at the higher frequency, what we're seeing, you know, again, we've got a resonance here, but as we've gone to higher frequency, our, what little bit of ground we have is actually doing a better job because our, our resistive part is now closer to what we'd expect for a vertical. So as you go to things like two meters, it's one of the reasons we can get away with, a, you know, a, a simple antenna on two meters like a rubber duck. Often the body of the radio and then capacity into your body provides enough counterpoise for the antenna to work, work reasonably well.
Okay, actually, one other thing I want to show you. We may have to take down the lights a little bit here. So one of the things I like to do is, is uh, uh, both my wife and I have, at various times in our careers have taught and taught science. We, I've worked with a science camp at the Research Institute in New Jersey. And I like teaching, kind of developing concepts to teach how things work, to break it down to even like elementary kids, to kind of give them an idea, maybe not you know, a deep understanding of Maxwell's equations, but an idea of what's going on in something. So this is a little demo that I've been playing with and kind of more geared toward the education, but I think it's kind of fun. Let's see if this will work. Are we working? Something's loose. Oops, okay. I guess something got broken on the, uh, on the trip out. So the idea here is to demonstrate graphically what's going on with uh, an antenna. Oh, there we go. I think we're unplugged. Well, as live demos go, there we are. Okay, so, so this, this is kind of intended to show the charge on an antenna, what's happening as that RF field flows in the antenna visually. So you can think about this as at any given time, one of these is positive and one is negative, and they're oscillating back and forth. And that, it's that electric charge that generates the electric field and the magnetic field and, and generates the RF wave that we call. So this is a way to try to demonstrate that to people just graphically to say, this is really what's happening in your antenna. It's basically oscillating back and forth. So anytime you look at an antenna, that's really what we want to do. We want to generate that field that then radiates out into space and makes contacts. Other people hear it somewhere. So, all right. So, um, you'll see some things occasionally about, as I said, someone comes out and says, hey, I've got this great new antenna. It's tiny, compact, lightweight, and it does everything, right? There's really not a free lunch. There's, there's some limitations of sci basic science and basic physics that say you can only do so much. This is one of those examples. I don't know if anybody has seen this before. It's, they, they also name it, you know, you typically, you think back to, you know, snake oil salesmen years ago. You heard about, you know, they would always say, I've got the cure for everything. I've got this, you know, drink this and it'll get rid of whatever's wrong with you, right? Well, this is the antenna version of that. You'll see these companies. I'm not trying to pick on any one company, but I will pick on one when they label stuff. So this is labeled the Miracle Whip, <laughs> right? And if you can read the text, unfortunately, I apologize, it's small, but basically, you know, very high performance, amazing, you know, does an incredible thing. Uh, about 10 years ago, we did a, what's called an antenna shootout at Pacificon. That's the big West Coast ham radio gathering held in San Ramon, California. And I took one of the Pac-12 prototypes there and entered it in the competition. The folks, someone brought one of these. This set up as specified and measured. And we had an antenna test range with a calibrated analyzer, calibrated source, so we knew what was going in the antenna and we knew what the field was calibrated against a, a full-size dipole, or sorry, a full-size vertical over ground. So the reference antenna was a full-size vertical on 20 meters. They actually claim this works down to 80 meters. I think it has a 36-inch whip on it. Um, when we tested this on 20 meters, it was 30 dB down from a, a quarter wave wire on 20 meters. That's 30 dB. That's a lot of signal loss. The interesting thing, we had it, someone brought an antenna that was a, a five foot telescoping whip with a dummy load at the base. So a 50 ohm resistor across the feed point with a whip connected to the 50 ohm resistor. It beat this by quite a bit, by about 10 dB. So they sold thousands of these. I mean, people buy these, there are people out there who rave about them. Can you make a contact with it? Yeah, probably, but you know, it's gonna, you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage. And again, I sort of object to this, you know, labeling something. This is another one, this is the same company. They have their Wonder, what is this, their Wonder Wand um, tunable compact loop. So this will do everything else that the other one doesn't do. 
This has, you basically put a little piece of copper wire on this and you're supposed to be able to work everything from 40 meters and up. Again, you know, because of the circulating currents, the losses, it, it will radiate some RF, but you know, if you're 20 or 30 dB down, you know, that's what, uh, you put a watt in and you're radiating microwatts, you know, kind of thing. It's, or, you know, a milliwatt, it's really, you're, you're limiting yourself. It's proof that you can make contacts with extremely low power. I mean, I know people who've made contacts cross country with a few milliwatts. It can be done. Um, this is another one. Now this one, you know, I've, I've seen one of these. I've actually used one of these. It can work, but again, it's, I sort of object to the super antenna thing, right? It's implying that there's something special about this little, you know, coil loaded vertical that's, you know, very short, very compact, that somehow is going to work better than it should be able to. Um, coincidentally, we tested one of my antenna prototypes. Um, sorry, whoops. Go back here. Oops. A little lag there. Oops. Let's stop there. So we tested one of the Pac-12 prototypes on that same test range. I think the theoretical, if you calculate the theoretical limit for the antenna with the loading coil size and the size of the antenna, was about 2 dB down from a full-size quarter wave. My antenna tested about 3 dB down. So it's still a lossy, but it's half the size of a full-size antenna, or less than half the size. So there's always some trade-off anytime you make the antenna smaller, but I think that may be why I object to some of these that, you know, they, they promise everything and, and don't really deliver that much. And, and, you know, when I saw this tested, it was really eye-opening how bad that was. This is another one that's, that's an interesting antenna. This is, I think these are called an isotron. It's basically this little compact antenna and they, they have versions of this from, I think they have listing ones on broadcast band all the way up through, you know, 10 meters. Well, what is it? When you break it down as an antenna, well, there's a loading coil in the middle and there's two plates on the end. So what it is, it's again, looking at that, that circuit for the antenna it's really that same circuit. It's just a whole lot of capacitance and some inductance to resonate it. Um, some people claim these things worked really well, really amazing. And uh, I saw finally someone who actually did a definitive test and they, they tried this in two cases. They put up the antenna and they tested it and it actually kind of worked, they were a little surprised. Then they basically put a choke on the feed line right at the antenna. As soon as they put a choke on the antenna, I think it dropped like eight or nine dB down. So the signals basically, most of the, most of the radiation from the antenna was actually the feed line connected to it, not this. This is just an inloading to kind of give you a 50 ohm looking thing. You know, this is kind of an analog of the, of the magnetic loop. This is, a, you can think of this as the electric version of a magnetic loop. The problem is to generate a big electric field, you need charge separation over area. So when you make that small, your electric field is really intense in this area, but it's not very big. So it's hard to generate a lot of magnetic field from that as well. So your electromagnetic wave this radiates is going to, by again, you look at the physics of this, it's going to have to be a pretty poor radiator and pretty poor receiver, and it is. I have a friend who blew up a $1,000 transceiver trying to get one of those to work. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's really just a resonant, you know, it's a resonant, sorry, the thing that's the clue on these is they claim pretty broad band. They claim this will cover most of the band on like 40 meters. If it's a true, really high Q resonant circuit, this thing should have bandwidth of probably like a couple of kilohertz. It's not going to have, a, you know, 100 kilohertz bandwidth or larger. So there's clearly Q there. And then there's some of these antennas where you take a bunch of sort of hamstick looking things and stick them all in one. Again, it works, but, you know, it's a trade-off. It's always about a trade-off. I mean, any antenna is better than none. You can always get, you know, some antenna up in the air and you can get a signal out. What we want to do is optimize creating that electromagnetic wave. We want to make our antenna as radiate as much as we can and lose as little as we can. That's always our goal. And so, you know, for me, a lot of these are pretty poor choice for that unless that's all I had. You know, I always believe I can do better. So anyway, again, I'd like to thank all of you for, for listening. And, uh, you know, I, I'd encourage you to get out there and play with some antennas, build something. It's a lot of fun to build. Um, there's a lot of kits out there and things for antennas. If you want to do it, there's a lot of articles out there to build antennas. There's a lot of fun places to go and set up an antenna. There's a group, um, internet group called Parks on the Air. Anybody familiar with that? 
So Parks on the Air is encouraging people to go out and activate state and national parks and basically take a portable antenna, set up a radio, get on the air. You announce it, there will be people, you know, basically trying to work you in the park. To, to, it's kind of like a D, it's kind of like a mini D expedition, I guess. It's like if the park is more rare, you're going to be more popular. If it's you know common park like you know Grand Canyon, probably nobody's going to care. But a um, little bit about this picture too. This is me testing one of the Pac-12 prototypes on the beach. This is the beach in, in, near Monterey and Pacific Grove in California. Um, I've got my brand new at that time 817 um, with me using it for testing. We've got a later picture where I set it on a rock and I was taking pictures. Uh, I'll just share this story because you'll, you'll appreciate this. I had just bought the radio. It's probably one of the first ones that Ham Radio Outlet in Sunnyvale got in. And I forget what I paid. It was like, you know, six, seven hundred dollars for the radio. And uh, it was kind of, you know, very nice. And it was, it was, it was something I was using for travel and, and taking with me whenever I went. On the Pacific, we get occasionally what are called rogue waves or so I had the radio sitting literally on this rock. I can't remember if you were there, Kathy, or not, but so you were taking those pictures. I don't know if you were when I did that, but I looked up and there was a wave coming in that was way bigger than these little waves that were lapping right about here. I ended up standing on the rock holding the radio over my head to keep it out of the water. I got wet up to about a little above my knees, fortunately. I was as big as it went, but uh, people actually do get swept off rocks and stuff by them. So it's sort of a learning experience about how, you know, you have this nice sort of, you know, relatively calm ocean and suddenly it can change. But it's a lot of fun to get out. And that's, for me, that's the fun part is get out, take a portable antenna, take something and get a, a battery powered radio, solar panel, whatever, get on the air and have fun. It's even more fun if you built the antenna and, and something you did. So again, thank you to everyone. Thanks to Ron for the invitation and uh, very much appreciate it. Thank you.